Chapter 21, Permaculture in Action. This list of applied permaculture examples shares a spectrum of examples where permaculture is applied. They do not represent all that is possible, nor do they represent all who are actively using permaculture to be more regenerative and profitable in their business or service. They are simply a selection of regenerative examples to share the many ways permaculture is being applied. Zaytuna Farm, reviewed by Jeff Lawton. This permaculture demonstration site in northern New South Wales, Australia was once an ecologically degraded dairy farm and is now 66 acres, 27 hectares of detailed and vibrant subtropical food forests, gardens, ponds and more designed to educate and inspire. It is an off-grid permaculture paradise. In development since 2001, world-renowned permaculture educators Jeff and Nadia Lawton regularly host groups of students, interns, homeschoolers, and tours. Jeff's farm has seemingly everything. Permaculture techniques and methods can be found in practice all over. They are off the electrical grid with solar power and their own generator. Their hot water comes from a rocket stove water heater. The toilets are all composting toilets and the gray water reed bed system is inspected and approved by local state officials. There is a metal shop, student kitchen, a commercial kitchen and housing for their family workers and interns. Sustainable materials like bamboo, which is on site, straw bales and natural plaster are sourced for building projects big and small whenever possible. Zaytuna is a full cycle farm that includes animals, people, and plants working together in harmonious cycles to produce an abundance of food that supports 45 people on site. Permaculture techniques like remineralization of soils using animals, compost, insect hotels, cell grazing of cattle, food forestry, biointensive gardening, and more are demonstrated and taught to students on site and through Jeff's online courses. Animal systems using ducks, chickens, cattle, and more are also constantly in operation. Using permaculture as the lens, interns learn about gardening, farming, dairy operations, omnivores, and cattle in context using permaculture techniques hands-on. Zaytuna Farm yields top-notch students and educators who continue to spread permaculture to people all over the world. Polyface Farm, reviewed by Joel Saladin. Joel Saladin's 550 acre, 222 hectare family farm, Polyface, began in 1961 as an eroded, gullied, and worn out farm. Joel and his father before him stewarded the land through an amazing recovery using a sophisticated holistic management system involving chickens, turkeys, cows, pigs, earthworms, and soil microbiology. Joel happily calls himself a grass farmer because that is the basis for his entire ecosystem, the annual solar energy trapped by grasses. Grass-based farming focuses on increasing the perennial grasses potential to photosynthesize, store carbon and rebound from grazing while turning a profit. Specifically, that means rotational grazing timed perfectly where animals are held at beneficial ratios of grazing space to animal density for a day or less. Cattle grazing is followed by chickens a few days after to spread out the cow manure, ending pest cycles while feeding the birds high protein fly larvae. This imitates the phenomenon observed in nature where birds travel and live in symbiosis with herbivores, spreading their manures eating larvae out of the manures and keeping parasites in check. In terms of animal secession, turkeys can follow the chickens, goats and sheep can clear brush and grasses to prepare the way for cows initially. Joel's operation is mature and focuses primarily on cows, chickens, layers and broilers, turkeys, and pigs. He integrates their systems ingeniously following the animal's instincts and desires as his guiding ethic. Saladin's approximately 100 cows graze 100 acres, 40 acres, about one acre, 40,000 square meters at a time using portable electric fencing. 
the paddocks are roughly all at the same elevation since different elevations have grasses germinating and developing at different times and rates. They return to the same area two to three times a season at most. They only spend 24 hours in any one space to avoid the second bite effect. Perennial pasture grasses have evolved to thrive when eaten to the ground in one grazing event by herbivores and then allowed to regrow as the tightly packed herd of grazers moved on, pressured by their natural predators. This process, unhindered in prehistory, created the deep, rich soils that humans naturally were drawn to for practicing agriculture. If we allow a second bite by grazing the following day, we interrupt the plant recovery and regrowth, which will begin to push the pasture holistically, soil, animals, and plants into decline. This is why grazers have been blamed for creating desertification. While more accurately speaking, it was grazing management that was at fault. Following after the cows are the laying hens in an egg mobile, a simple portable shelter featured earlier in Convection, page 22, that lacks an electric fence. They have feed, pasture, and the freedom to range, but they primarily focus on spreading the cow manure patties and eating the insect and parasite larvae inside. They spread them out and sanitize them by increasing surface area and exposing them to the air, sun, and wind. This means that the cows rarely have flies on them and never need any special treatments for parasites. The salatins don't use vaccines or antibiotics. They cull sick animals quickly, monitor closely, and mimic nature, which makes for strong genetics and functional immune systems that don't need vaccines or antibiotics. Turkeys often follow the chickens, and then the pasture rests until the return of the cows, or they grow it out for hay. This system makes for delectable eggs, pasture-raised beef, and pasture-raised soup birds in a sanitized, carbon-sequestering pasture system. Joel's system sources lumber from his property that is sustainably cut and milled on site. He does supplement his laying hens with local non-GMO grain, which Joel admits is their weakest point. In winter, the Saladins rely on a clever deep bedding method where the cattle feed on baled hay for the pastures they visited lightly that previous season. They eat from troughs on pulleys that raise and lower to unload the hay from the top of the stacked hay bales as well as keep the feeding troughs off the rising ground. This all occurs inside a hay barn that is half stacked hay bales and the other half deep bedding. A layer of straw and wood chips with some grain mixed in gets laid down after each feeding to combine with the manure from the visiting cows. By mixing in the grain with this new layer of bedding, it creates a compost heap littered with fermented grains, which for a pig is a cross between a buffet and a treasure hunt. In their enthusiastic searching, they turn the matted layers into a fluffy mix, making it easy for the farm interns to remove and relocate to where it can be fully composted. Most of the compost gets spread out onto the fields to support the foundation of the entire system, the pasture. But some goes into the Saladin's vegetable garden. The deep bedding method of adding carbon throughout a season can be applied to many different animal systems. There are chickens over winter living below rabbits inside a rakin rabbit plus chicken house where they live in a deep bedding situation. The rabbit manure and chicken manure are mixed with a carbon source like wood chips or straw regularly to keep the ratios composting and sanitary. This leads to a rising floor. By using pigs to loosen the bedding initially and using a tractor to transport the bedding to a large compost area where it can be turned further with a tractor, Joel has created a system where labor and time are saved and animals are utilized as much as possible in synchronization with their instincts. Joel hosts regular farm tours, has an internship program, and has a farm store that is open regularly while his son Daniel Saladin runs the daily business of the farm. It truly is a farm of many faces, but all pointed towards regeneration. New Forest Farm, reviewed by Mark Shepard. 
designed to mimic the oak savanna that once dominated the Midwestern United States. Mark Shepard's new forest farm in Wisconsin, established in 1995 at 106 acres, 43 hectares, is the oldest commercial-sized permaculture site in America. Versaland and New Forest Farm together are the leading examples of permaculture production farming in the Midwest. Growing up, Mark recognized a dissonance between the freely given abundance of the forest and the hard, sought-after products of the garden, where serious work and constant management were required. His insight led him on a quest to solve the great holistic problem of our day, how to live regeneratively. Inspired by Fukuoka, J. Russell Smith, Bill Mollison and Henry David Thoreau, Mark with his family transformed former dairy farmland into an oak savanna polyculture using a network of adapted key line swales. It is managed with silver pasture, operations using chickens, pigs, and cattle, as well as alley cropping of annual vegetables. Ecological restoration is a foundational concept of Shepherd's operation. His work is undoing the damage done by overgrazing and poor management even while producing food crops. His farm is a member of Organic Valley, which is a farmer-owned consortium with a product line recognized nationwide in U.S. grocery stores. While establishing his system, Mark understood that there were no known successful chestnut varieties for his area and realized that getting the right genetics would take a variety of trials. Mark has developed a system for getting the hardiest, most resilient and vigorous plants for his area, with vigor being sourced from their genetics, not water or fertilizer. The STUN method stands for Strategic Total Utter Neglect. Mark plants his trees close together, which makes it obvious which plants perform better than others, and then aggressively culls out the weak plants, as Joel Saladin does with his sick animals. This has led to selecting and propagating the best of the best of the best of the best and so on for over 20 consecutive seasons with all his varieties. His genetics are now highly sought after and support a profitable plant nursery business. New Forest Farm has oak and chestnut canopies with cherry and apple in the understory, hazelnuts at the shrub layer with cane berries currants below them and grapes climbing throughout. It is a thriving oak savanna, wonderland of food, timber, and fiber where the focus is not on MPK, but on ecological health. Nature has never spent a dime on pest or disease control or fertility. Mark Shepard, Permaculture Voices, 2014. Krummeterhof, reviewed by Zach Weiss. Nearly 5,000 feet, 1,500 meters above sea level, Nestled high in the Austrian Alps in a place known as Austria Siberia lies the Krameterhof, Sepp Holzer's family farm, where he grew up and took over management in 1962. Since that time, it has been a place of natural farming experimentation. His experimentations and stalwart determination have earned Sepp the title Agro Rebel. Krameterhof is a 111 acre 45 hectare site with 72 ponds and a more than 1,000 feet 400 meter difference in elevations. With 116 days of frost and an average temperature of 41 degrees Fahrenheit, 5 degrees Celsius. The landscape is a polycultural myriad of microclimates on large terraces that prevent the slopes from eroding and allow for water they soak up to slowly release during the summers. It is covered with ponds stocked with European crawfish, carp, trout, and pike. Sepp does not irrigate. His area receives enough precipitation, selecting seeds from the best plants in the poorest soils and spreading those seeds has built over time a collection of extremely hardy and exuberant plants. His microclimates at one point even supported citrus, which is unheard of in his area. He uses no soil amendments, but focuses instead on the whole system's health. Sepp uses animals to assist in managing the farm, especially pigs. Pigs will turn the soil, make ponds, and move stubborn plants like a blackberry patch just by following their natural inclinations. Housing mixed species cattle and pigs inside earth shelters, Holzer keeps them in large habitat paddocks held in place with an assortment of fencing types, living, metal, wood, electric, and more. 
SEP also uses pigs with portable electric fences to reforest areas. SEP Holter at times, like Fukuoka, does not prune, especially in a broad acre setting. He allows the branches to grow and fall below the horizon line which stimulates fruiting rather than vegetative growth. He also grafts his trees with sometimes very interesting combinations. He protects his trees from wildlife with a homemade bone sauce that's flicked or dabbed onto tree trunks. See picture to make your own. The sticky, stinky substance stays on the trunk's bark for several seasons. Though some, like Zach Weiss, make it annually and simply flick on a dab on each tree in early spring. It is primarily animal fat so it hardens when cool and is non-soluble so watering or rain won't remove it. SEP is also known within the U.S. for popularizing hugel culture gardening or mound culture gardening where wood and woody biomass is buried under soil in a mound. As the wood breaks down, it releases nutrients, retains water, and can generate heat at times, but usually does not. Sep grows annuals and perennials on his hugel cultures. He also uses them to generate topsoil. Once the wood is fully broken down, the mounds shrink in size, but are piles of soil rich in organic matter, perfect for growing annuals and perennials. Throughout his system, Sep also uses rocks and boulders. Boulders serve as thermal masses in his microclimates, keeping areas warm overnight and lengthening their growing season. Rock piles are also used as moisture condensers in animal habitat. Some herbs are even grown in rocky areas on the Kermiterhof because they provide the best medicine. Many wild herbs prefer naturalized soil to rich garden soils. Sep came to this realization through observation, trial, and error. Sep's childhood was immersed in nature and led to his deep understanding of it. Today, Sep teaches and consults all over the world and lives at the Holzerhof. His son Joseph manages the Kermiterhof, where there are tours, classes, and new discoveries regularly occurring, such as Joseph's successful grafting of both apple and pear onto mountain ash for an extremely hardy rootstock and to keep fruit above the natural browsers. Paradise Lot with over 200 different perennial plant varieties on a tenth of an acre, 400 square meters. Paradise Lot would have been impressive in any climate, but to be in the cold, temperate climate of Massachusetts, USA, with banana plants for mulch in the front yard, and a subtropical plant-filled greenhouse in the backyard for year-round food from the garden is beyond impressive. When best friends Eric Tonsmeyer and Jonathan Bates purchased the duplex, a house split in two separate apartments in 2001, the backyard was a barren lot, devoid of vegetation. With this blank slate, Eric and Jonathan designed an abundant vision and put it into reality with hard work, persistence, and good design. From the plants surrounding the pavement of their parking spaces, which hold thermal mass, to the dense growth ringing the edge of the property like a green wall. There is no bare earth. Every space is used. Chickens are tucked onto the side of the backyard, which is only 90 by 45 feet, 15 by 30 meters. There is even aquaculture inside and outside the greenhouse. The water inside the greenhouse serves as a thermal mass, radiating heat overnight in cold winters to keep plants warm. The side yards and small backyard are a rich perennial food forest of pigeon peas, plums, mulberries, hardy kiwis, grapes, Asian pears, blueberries, pawpaws, Chinese yam, watercress, arugula, and much, much more. Jonathan and Eric sell the new plants the perennials generate and give workshops teaching locals how to make their own lots abundant. Paradise Lot is a superb cold climate urban permaculture example. The Urban Homestead, reviewed by Jordane Dervais. Since 1990, the Dervais family has been working on being self-sufficient in the middle of Pasadena, California. 15 minutes away from downtown Los Angeles and 100 feet from a major freeway with only a tenth of an acre of land to grow on. 3,900 feet squared, 1,189 meters squared. When the Dervais learned about how pervasive GMOs were in commercial food, the family mulched over the lawn and installed a tightly packed garden and homestead system providing for 75% of their food needs. 
They are a perfect example of hyperlocal seasonality in the city. The Dervais use biointensive planting densities to save water. The family raises pygmy goats, ducks, dwarf rabbits, and chickens for milk, eggs, and manure, but not meat. They are vegetarians. They sell their extra eggs, edible flowers, and organic heirloom produce to local restaurants and run a front porch farmstead, earning an average annually of $65,000. Their kitchen waste is either processed by the animals or composted in various ways, and then it is put back into the garden or used in compost tea. Since 2003, their dervais have grown 5,000 to 6,000 pounds, 2,200 to 2,700 kilograms of food every year. Using a gray water system, Oya pots, rainwater harvesting, and mulch, their annual water bill is only $600. They have a solar panel array, but no backup battery, so they are still hooked up to the grid, which is less expensive and easier for their situation, though they've expressed that outside of a city, they would like to be completely off the grid. Using less than six kilowatts a day, the Dervais use less than a quarter of the electricity used by the average Pasadena citizen, which is 25 kilowatts a day. The Dervais lifestyle is the glue that binds all the systems together. They use less, save more. From home-brewed biodiesel from the restaurants they work with, to the assortment of hand-cranked kitchenware, to the solar and cob ovens, to the pedal-powered wheat grinder, to seed saving, to homeschooling, to staycations, to upcycling crafts, the urban homestead is a holistic system that is not just about food or business. It is a way of life that they find ethical.